with that, I'm going to introduce Matt Wallert. Uh, Matt has worked in, worked in academia, startups, the Fortune 500, and now at Frog, a cap Gemini company, as a head of behavioral science, where he focuses on helping organizations build their own applied behavioral science capabilities while building projects with the Frog team. Matt is a well-known speaker on behavioral strategy, insights, design, and how impact evaluation can help us build products and services that change behavior. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Matt uh, for today's conversation and session. So as he mentioned, my name is Matt Wallert. I've been an applied behavioral scientist for the last 20 or so years of my life. Um, I was originally an academic. Um, and uh, thank you for telling me you're out there. I'm glad you're doing well. Like, use the chat. I love this. Hey, Sky, good to see you. Um, I've been an applied behavioral scientist for the last 20 or so years of my life. I started out as a social psychologist, went off and did a PhD and figured out, hey, that's not going to be the right path for me. I want to move things in the world, right? And so I became the head of product at a startup, um, which is a good way to move things in the world. And that went well. We got acquired, all those things, um, became the head of behavioral science at Microsoft, a chief behavioral officer at Clover Health, helped them go public um, and cause trouble wherever I am. So what I want to talk about today is you know, having existed in the world originally when I was the head of product, we didn't even have a term for behavioral science, applied behavioral scientists. We called me the chief be, uh, chief scientific officer at one point, I think, right? Like we were struggling a lot to figure out how to articulate what I do. And what I now believe and want to share with you is the notion essentially that product marketing, all these other things are actually horizontal uh, sort of silos that are more about what behavior we're changing than how we change behavior, right? Instead, what I would suggest is that the future of all of everything is behavioral science, right? The notion that everything we do, we do to change behavior and that the scientific method is the best possible way to make that happen. So what do I mean when I say everything we do, we do to change behavior? You know, if Scott came to me and he said, hey, Matt, I want you to make me a chair, right? I run a furniture company. What he's really saying is I want something that gets people to sit, right? And when you think of it that way, you're like, yeah, Matt, that's kind of dumb. But when you think of it that way, Maybe it's a chair, but maybe it's a bench. Maybe it's a beanbag. Maybe it's a pair of anti-gravity pants where we sort of lean back and it just sort of props me up in the air, right? What we, how we articulate what we're trying to do changes the solution that we make. So if we say, hey, we're going to make a chair, we will replicate that same chair over and over and over. Maybe we'll get minor variations. Somebody will optimize it. We'll get a slightly better chair than we had before. But at the end of the day, if we're looking for, for things that actually change behavior, actually change the world, actually break through, actually get us our, our anti-gravity pants. Man, I saw the Jetsons. I'm waiting for my pants. We have to recalibrate towards a farther future, towards the behavior that we want, articulating the behavior that we want in the world, right? Fundamentally, for an applied behavioral scientist like me, I believe that all businesses are just monetized behavior change. That's what business is. Business changes a behavior and then monetizes. Uber gets you from point A to point B through an Uber and then charges you for it. Spotify monetizes the behavior that is listening. Visa monetizes the behavior that is transacting. Venmo monetizes the behavior that is transacting, right? And they compete with each other. When we think about business as just applied behavior change, right? It's really just how well are we, how good are we at changing behavior and how good are we at monetizing that? Right. I think how good are we at monetizing that? Often business strategy, CEO, other places, right? We talk about product led CEOs. What they're really doing is mar marrying monetization to some form of behavior change. But what those of us in the room are trying to do is actually change that behavior at some core and root level. Now, remember, I said I think science is the best way to do that. It's not just because I love science. I do believe science is amazing and I do love science. But science is the most beautiful thing that humans have created because it gives us the ability to create replicable change, right? Find things that work in different environments repeatedly. And that's really key and really important. And so how do we use the scientific method as product folks? Well, first, I think we have to think about this sort of, you know, uh, infinity symbol of build the thing right or sorry, build the right thing, build the thing right. I'm not talking about build the thing right. There is a whole section of product that has become like, how do we decompose things into JIRA tickets so that engineers can, can build them? And how do I make sure those engineers stay on track? And how do I align that against a calendar? I think of that as all build the thing right. And it's really interesting to me because in almost every other evolved mature field, that is its own thing, right? There is a general contractor who builds the building, right? They're not the architect. They're not the designer. They are the person who builds the building and makes sure that all of those things line up on time in schedule, et cetera. We start to see that with technical products product management, sort of, right? But I actually think that's its own whole discipline. It is, a, it is to me, false to, to believe that people who are good at getting something built are the same as good, at the same goodness as people who are figuring out what it is we need to build, right? What we might think of as product strategy. 
So when I talk about behavioral science, what I mean is this half over here. How do we figure out what actually changes behavior in the first place? I would argue that the best way to understand this is science fiction. So let's take, who do I want to talk to this morning? Ellen. Ellen is an author of science fiction. Now, you probably didn't uh, think of that when you woke up this morning, Ellen. You probably didn't think, you know what? I am a science fiction author, but it's true. How do I know? Well, because you got up this morning, got out of bed. You want to change the world. Anytime you try and change the world, you are definitionally living in the realm of the fictional, right? Maybe not the green alien fictional, but we might get there, right? The world that Ellen wants doesn't yet exist. It is definitionally made up, right? And so that's where we have to start as product people. We have to start by articulating who is going to be doing what in a future world. This is the way every good science fiction story starts, right? It posits a future and then explains that future to us in very specific ways. Who is going to be doing what and why? How are we going to understand, understand and observe this? Good science fiction novels show, right? Don't tell. So they show us behavior of people. In behavioral science, right? Applied behavioral science, which I believe is the future product, right? And by the way, to be clear, I don't mean translational research. I don't mean you read a paper, you read Nudge or something, and you just go do those things in the world. That's not interesting to me. I mean using the scientific method in situ. And if we want to use the scientific method in situ, we need to start by articulating the world as we want it to be. I can put a behavioral statement in the chat there. This is the formalized articulation that my team uses, right? Who is going to be doing what and why? Who's not going to be doing it? Who's outside of our consideration in the world that we want, in Ellen's imaginary future? Why do we do this? Well, one, we need a metric of success, right? We have to understand what good looks like. And this is really important if we want to create a more equitable world. We live in a world where a lot of product development looks like whoever is the boss decides what we build, right? What we often think of as epiphany-based design. Maybe we put some things around that, like we're going to do some design thinking. So Kate and Micah and Ellen and Jack and I are all going to get in a room. And we're going to put things on the board. But the reality is whoever's the boss is going to say, here's the thing that we're going to build. And unfortunately, those bosses are too often white, too often male, too often older. And so we get a world that caters to white male, older folks. That's not a scientific world. That's not a good world. That's not an equitable world. It's not the world we want. In order to change that world, however, we have to make a way for Ellen's you know, suggestion to beat out Matt's suggestion as the boss. And the only way we can do that is by building evidence that Ellen's suggestion is the better one. But in order to do that, I am speaking very fast. Don't worry, there'll be a video, right? We, we can, you can watch it again. I can slow down. Nicole, thank you. I appreciate the feedback. I'll slow down. I'll bring it back. It's early in the morning. I'm hamped up. I just force fed a seven-year-old a waffle as quickly as I could so that he could go off to school and I could do this. So I'll bring it back. Thank you for the feedback, Nicole. If we want a world where Ellen's suggestion beats out Matt, the boss's suggestion, where the janitor could beat the boss, we need a world where we know what better means, right? Where I can say this chair is better than that chair because it gets the kind of people that we're interested to have sitting, sit, right? So that's why we articulate the world we want, right? It gives a suggestion a better. Two, it helps avoid what I call alignment drift or the six-week problem. I'm sure we have all experienced this. Jack and I are working on something or Jeanette and I are working on something and Jeanette and I come into a meeting about six weeks in and she says, oh, you meant this? I meant that. My favorite is the word engagement. People can work on engagement and be working on totally different things for very long periods of time before they figure out that they are talking about totally different behaviors in the world, right? Buying is engagement. Reviewing is engagement. Looking at something is engagement. Everything is engagement, right? So it avoids that drift. Even if we start slightly misaligned, right? Even if Kate and I are like 1% off, as we go through time, right? 1% becomes 2%, becomes 3%, becomes 4%, right? We drift off. A behavioral statement, right? Articulating the world that we want helps us stay laser aligned so that we have something we can refer back to and say, hey, are we doing the same thing? And I literally put this on the first slide, right? In every, you know, stand up and every week check-in, right? We want to be going like, hey, are we still on target? Do we still agree? This is not a new practice for product, right? We have lots of North Star metrics and sort of like vision statements and things. But the problem is when they're not behavioral, right? It's very easy to misinterpret them, right? Don't be evil, serve our customers. Those are interesting maxims, but they mean very different things to very different people. We need to be more precise, right? We need to be more precise. Why? Because we want to change an actual specific behavior, right? This is the last error that happens. All the time, you know, um, David comes to me, CEO of a company says, Matt, I want you to get people to, I want to, I want you to make a product that people love. David, I don't know what love is, but I want you to show me. What do you mean? Do you mean review, buy, use, like tell your friends about? 
all of those are different forms of the behavior that we think of as love, right? So we want to be really articulate about the world that we want. So Ellen has now told us the world that we want. And like any good science fiction author, she has to tell us how we got there, right? She needs a backstory. We don't just magically appear in the world we want. It's a progression, a path from where we are. So the next step is that we have to understand where we are, right? We often refer to this as insights in applied behavioral science, right? You might have this today in the form of user research or data science, business analytics, if your business analytics and data science or, or data science and user research teams are reporting in different parts of the org, you are you are setting yourselves up for failure. They need to come together into a unified process to help us understand the world that we have today. But we need to understand the world in a really specific way, right? We need to understand two things. One, why would anyone want to live in Ellen's alternative universe? Why is this a better future? Why does it have gravity? Why does it pull us towards it? Why is it interesting? Right. And then two, given that it's interesting, given that people want to live there, given that Micah wants to live in Ellen's world, why aren't they already living in that world? What's pushing back? What are those inhibiting pressures that are competing? This is important because I am a lying liar. You should learn this throughout the whole talk. If you take nothing away, take away that Matt is a lying liar because I can't change behavior directly. I can't pop open Sky's brain and find the sit button, right? And hit it and she'll sit in a chair. That's not how behavior change works. I don't change behavior directly. I change behavior through pressures, right? Through the things that interact in Sky's environment to then change that behavior, right? So we're not actually changing behavior. What we're doing is rebalancing the pressures of today. But we can't do that if we don't understand what those pressures are, right? That's where quantitative and qualitative research, user research and data science, come together to help us, right? We need understandings of the world they are today. And we're going to look at five really key groups. Always, never, sometimes started, stopped, right? I don't like personas with cutesy names and bunch of demographics. Why? Because gender doesn't actually matter, right, in and of itself. Gender matters because it changes the pressures that we encounter in the world, right? So rather than focusing on the gender, focus on the pressures that are engendered because of it, right? Every ability in the world, though, however, fits into one of five categories. Always, never, sometimes started, stopped, right? Nicholas always cooks. Nikita never cooks. Ryan cooks sometimes. Mohit used to cook, doesn't anymore. Michael didn't used to cook, but has recently started. Everybody in the world fits into one of those five categories for any behavior that you pick, right? It could be doing yoga. It could be cooking. It could be going for a run. It could be taking an Uber. It doesn't matter. Everybody fits into one of those five categories. So we're always going to use those as our basic five behavioral categories, right? The reason that I call this talk Bending the Spoon, uh, for those who, who are old enough to remember The Matrix, there is obviously me as a small child. Uh, I'm dressed as a monk at the time, and I'm bending spoons with my mind, right? Neo, the, the main character, comes to talk to me, and he is very impressed by my spoon bending. And the kid says something really interesting. He says, don't try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Just recognize that you're the one that bends, right? We don't change behavior. We just change pressures. That's our job in the world. We're bending spoons, but we're not reaching out with our hands and bending the spoons. We're changing the environment in which the spoons exist, the rules of the system that then cause the spoon to bend itself. This is really important because I think it's what product people get wrong. We think of ourselves as interacting directly on people's things. I will build a product that makes people do this thing. It's not true. There's an intervening step. And all of this applied behavioral science that we're talking through, this whole process of how we align is all built around this notion that we are in fact interacting with pressures, not with behaviors themselves, right? Everything we do is an intervention for those pressures. So now we understand where we want to go, right? Like a strategic step. Ellen has articulated the world as it will be when we are successful, right? We have now observed the world we want. Jack, Mike Quant, and Jeanette, Mike Wall have like told me stable, articulate things about the balance of pressure that exists in the world today, right? Now I get to a design step, right? I'm designing against those pressures. How are we going to go actually change those things themselves, right? But I'm not, I don't then launch it, right? I don't go immediately to scale. Instead, I have to pilot. I have to run an experiment. Now, again, this is a thing that most product people think of doing. Hey, I'm going to try something small before I try something big. But we make a couple of errors. One, we often do operational pilots. Can I do this? Not, is it a good idea, right? Operational piloting needs to come later. I just assume, right, when we're trying it, when we're in the build the, the right thing side of the equation, I just assume that I can figure out how to build it. You are smart people. You'll figure it out. We'll figure out the technical considerations. We'll figure out how to decompose this. We'll figure out how long it takes. 
All of those things have to be subordinate to should we even do this in the first place? I don't think we ask that question often enough, right? We get very, very bogged down in like how long, how many engineer hours, how much does it take to deploy? And don't think about whether we should be even be doing that at all, right? So we have to start there. That's what this whole thing is tuned around. And that's the kind of pilot that you're running. You're running quick and dirty things that give you some evidence this is even a good idea in the first place before you worry about any of the operational pieces. Pilots should do three things for you, right? You can think of them as a gate system, right? The first thing they have to tell you is, was I even able to move the pressure at all, right? So let's say that we think, you know, one of the promoting pressures to getting people to sit is comfiness, right? That like that feeling of being warmed and enveloped in this lovely, wonderful chair, like comfort is a big promoting pressure. It's one of the dominant reasons that people sit, right? Okay, cool. So I need to try a pilot that says, hey, can I even make a chair that people find really comfy? What does comfy even mean in the first place, right? So that's the first checkpoint. Did I actually change the pressure? So if I go to Jack and I say, you know, how, do, how does that, I'm pushing some chairs, which one feels the most comfortable? I get an idea of, what he perceives as comfort. The second gate is, okay, I move the pressure. Jack is successfully telling me, hey, this chair is more comfortable, but did I move the behavior? Is he any more likely to sit in that chair, right? Because I could get the pressure totally right. I'm able to lean on that lever, but it turns out, you know, that pressure just doesn't matter as much as we thought. Really, it's not comfort that determines whether Jack sits. It's chair height or it's, you know, sort of availability in the world, right? How easily does it follow him around? right? It's other pressures. So does the pressure actually change the behavior? So the first step is, did I change the pressure? The second step is, did the pressure change the behavior? And the third one is quantification, right? How much was it worth it, right? Because I can get Jack, I can make this beautiful chair. Jack says it's super comfy and it gets him to sit 1% more. Is 1% more enough to make an entire chair out of? Maybe, maybe not. That's a strategic decision. This is the other place where I think uh, product goes wrong. We often think of ourselves as making decisions, where in fact, I actually think what we're doing is creating the evidence that allows others to make decisions, right? A good pilot doesn't tell us whether we should do something or not. It just tells us what is the cost benefit ratio of doing that, right? So that others can understand. So let's say, um, who haven't I picked on in a bit? Uh, I'll scroll down. Nikita, Nikita is my CEO, right? I don't want to say, Nikita, we should definitely do this thing is the one and only thing we should do. What I want to say is, hey, we tried five things. Three of them worked at a ratio I want to talk to you about. One of them, really expensive, but gets most people to do the thing most of the time, right? I have this other one. It's quite cheap. It gets some of the people to do it some of the time, right? And then I have this other one. It's kind of in the middle. It gets a very specific group of people to do it really often. So it's not broadly applicable, but it has a lot of power then she can make a de strategic decision about what is best for us as a company, right? My job is not to make the decision. My job is to give her evidence that allows her to choose between those things in a way that is right for the business strategy of our company, right? That monetization step. You can inform that with math and things. How big is the audience? How big was the impact? But at the end of the day, that's a strategic decision. And it is often a bet, right? I want to bet on this high cost, high impact thing because we're going bigger, going home. Or no, you know what? This The cheap and cheerful thing is good enough for this particular problem, for this particular behavior that I'm creating. A couple more notes, and then I'm going to try and take some Q&A. And if there's no Q&A, I will just tell you other stories. I can give you lots of examples. We can talk about whatever you want. Um, this is why I'm talking so fast, uh, Nicholas, so that I can get to the place where where we can do questions. A couple other pieces uh, of feedback, right? We are creating evidence to make decisions. What decisions are we making? Well, remember when I said we're going to do these behavioral statements? We're actually going to do cascading behavioral statements. I'm going to bring back every product person's worst nightmare, the waterfall. Yes, but it's not a feature waterfall, right? It's a waterfall of behavioral statements. Nikita, as the head of our company, Nikita, let's, let's use Uber. Nikita is the new head of Uber. So her behavioral statement is something like when people want to go from point A to point B, they will take an Uber as measured by total revenue or something like that, right? Nicholas is her head of marketing. Nick is her head of product. Just to be extra confusing, we're going Nick with Nicholas and Nick. Nicholas is her, her head of marketing. She says to Nicholas, your job is to get people to download the app, the behavior that is downloading the app. You don't have to worry about using the app. That's someone else, right? You have a sub behavioral statement of mine. I'm passing you down this attribute, this, this, you know, sort of accountability that is getting people to download. And then Nick, she can say, hey, your job is to get people to order a ride. You don't have to worry about downloads. Nicholas has got the ball on that. No worries, right? Your job as the head of product is to get people to order rides. Then we can bring in Mohit. Mohit is the head of rider experience. Mohit, you don't have to worry about getting people to order rides, but once they're in the car, 
they need to complete their ride and pay for it. That's your behavior, right? So we can segment behaviors down into individual teams. You can do this as a head of product, right? One of the beautiful things about being clear about the behaviors that we want to create in the world is that we can link accountability, which leads to autonomy. The reason that work is worth doing, right? As a junior product person, what I want is autonomy. I want to be able to find my own way to create the behavior for which I'm accountable. Behavioral statements help us do that by cascading that down, right? So you can imagine underneath Nicholas, you know, somewhere at the, you know, Scott, Scott Baldwin is our summer intern here at Uber, right? Nicholas can go all the way down and say, Scott, your job is to get young women in LA to download the app, right? He can segment to a smaller target audience and then hold Scott accountable to that, right? We now have a metric. We understand what it means that you're trying to drive and you have autonomy to do that. I can give you suggestions. Here's how I do it. But at the end of the day, you get to choose because I can now hold you accountable. That linked accountability and autonomy is only possible when we're clear about what success means, right? In a physical, observable way. No love, I mean review, and here's what review means, or I mean buy, and here's what buy means. And we could do all sorts of different metrics, right, that change what we build. How we choose to measure success will change what we build in very dramatic ways, right? If I say, well, what I want is the maximum number of people who take at least two Ubers a week, right? I want everyone in the world to take at least two Ubers a week. That's very different than total number of rides, right? If I'm going after total numbers of rides, I might find Yuki who like does a, she's an Uber rider. She rides 150 times a week. I'm going to try and get her to do the 151st because it's much easier than getting Ryan who's never taken one to do it for the first time, right? But if I'm saying, hey, I need everybody in the world to do it at least twice, then I have to go after Ryan, right? Yuki's already done 150 times. I don't care. I'm going after Ryan, right? How we define success will change what we build. All right. Uh, we talked about linked accountability and autonomy. We've talked about our wonderful, you know, sort of uh, always, never, sometimes, start, stopped, which Scott helpfully put in there, right? We talked about moving from strategy to insights, uh, to design, to to some sort of impact evaluation. Let's give me, let me give you a few more sort of salty things. I'm going to do a few more examples, and then I'm going to try and wrap up at 8:35 for questions. Or you could just put your questions in, like Jack did, and I will answer them in situ. I love it, Jack. By the way, thank you for being a trailblazer that reduces the inhibiting pressure for other people. Uh, so I love it and creates a strong promoting pressure because you got called out for being awesome, right? Strong promoting pressure. Hey, speaker thinks I'm awesome. Weakened inhibiting pressure. Oh yeah, it's totally fine to put questions in the chat. Mm, see, even this talk is an intervention, right? I'm trying to convince you, hey, here's the way we should do things. We're gonna you know, create some, some, some promoting pressures and I'm trying to tell you how to do it. I'm trying to make it easier. I'm trying to give you frameworks to think about, right? I'm reducing those inhibiting pressures right? That's what we're doing in the world. Even this talks and intervention. I have things I want you to do. I want you to write a behavioral statement. I want you to identify those promoting and inhibiting pressures, make a pressure map of what those are. All of those things I'm trying to get you to do through the intervention that is this talk. Even this talk is a product or a service, depending on how you look at it. But it is trying to intervene in the world to make something more likely. Hopefully not too passive aggressively. I try to be directly aggressive, Jack. Um, all right, Jack's question. How do you, or is it even possible, to prioritize a list of whatever's products, features, bugs, fixes, iterative improvements after behavioral analysis has been done or a new behavioral analysis has been established? I mean, it might also mean, are there behavioral analysis specific to behavior? Per yes. So um, each, each behavior has its own sort of measurement associated with it, right? So, uh, and those are often strategic in nature. There's no such thing as a right or wrong behavioral statement. It is just a negotiation between you and your stakeholders, right? Uh, I can't remember. Nikita. Nikita is our CEO. It is a conversation, Jack, between you and Nikita about, well, what are we going after? Are we going after two rides for everybody? Are we going after maximal number of rides? Are we going after percentage of rides that happen across 24 hours a day, right? We, it's a deep discussion about what is it we actually want. And people often think of this as easy. Right. And what I guarantee you is if you go and try and write one of these for whatever the hell you're building right now, you have a very hard time. And if you then circulate that among your team and ask them to write, ask everybody to write their own and then compare them, they will not be the same. Right. You think you're aligned, but really when it gets down to the nitty gritty, there's almost always some wobble. Right. I just want to take all of the arguments that we're going to have, all the misunderstandings we're going to have over the course of a project and move them right to the beginning. Right. And sometimes we have to disagree and commit. You know, uh, uh, Nikita thinks we should go after everybody gets two rides. Nicholas thinks we should go after maximum number of rides. Someone's going to have to disagree and commit in order for us to move forward. Right. Uh, does that sort of answer your question, Jack? 
I'm sort of picking around the edges of it. Feel free to clarify in the chat if, if I have not answered and, and I will make an attempt. A couple of things I want to share that are important. One of the reasons that we do this is science is explicitly debiasing. The reason we do, like if we were great, what I call epiphany-based designers, right? Where we could just get in a room and think about something and then magically an answer came out. We wouldn't need science, right? We would just come up with the right answer on our own. The problem is we have, we have predictable biases in our own understandings of the world. I'll give you a good example. When we think about getting people to do something more, we almost always generate promoting pressure ideas. So if I go after all of you and I say, hey, you're going to be a consultancy, right? Um, uh, you're, you're, all, you're going to be a consultancy now, and I want you to get people to eat more M&Ms. You will almost always generate promoting pressure-based interventions, new flavors, new colors, new bags, like, you know, interesting games that you can play with them. We have a statistical bias towards promoting pressures when we think about getting people to do something more. This is also true on the inhibiting pressure side. So if I say to you, hey, get people to smoke less, you'll almost always think about taxes and laws and making it illegal and making commercials where people go, and then you scare the hell out of people so they don't smoke. Here's the reality. That means there is unmet need on the other side, right? You're leaving a whole set of interventions on the table. The reality of getting people to eat more M&Ms is that you can do it often through just inhibiting pressures. Imagine right now that I was godlike and mythical in my powers, and I just snapped my fingers, and there was a bowl of M&Ms in front of all of you. Some of you would be eating M&Ms right now, right? You're off camera, you're feeling good, you're hiding, but you're like, mm, I would be eating some M&Ms. Think about how magical that is, because I didn't change the promoting pressures at all. They're no more beautiful or caloric or tasty or attractive or well-branded. Like, I didn't change any of that. All I did was just make it slightly easier to do, right? I manipulated those inhibiting pressures. That's what Uber did, right? The Uber experience is not better than what it replaced. They started in black cars. I used to be, you know, uh, picked up by some guy in like a lovely Lincoln town car. Now I get picked up by some guy in the back of, and I'm like getting in the back of his Tercel. Like it is not a better experience. What did they do? They removed inhibiting pressures. This is where marketing and product have to be in lockstep, right? If you look at early Uber marketing, it was never about you're going to have a better ride. Sure, periodically they do things where they're like, you get ice cream or a puppy or it's a Maserati or whatever it is. But in reality, what did they always say in the beginning? It's cheaper than it ever was before. There's now more drivers on the road, so you won't have to wait. Or we could go somewhere we couldn't go, right? Now we can go to the airport. It will go farther away from town. Those are all inhibiting pressure-based product and marketing ideas, right? They're all about reducing the things that make me not go somewhere easily through an Uber, right? Not giving me new reasons to do something. That's why they had Uber, they moved through like eight different rewards programs and it never really seems to make a difference. Why? Because it's not a promoting pressure product. It's an inhibiting pressure product, right? This is, I'm very angry at New Yorkers. I, I am a former New Yorker. I live in San Diego now. I feel like New Yorkers should have invented Uber because if you have ever been in the East Village on a one-way street on a Friday night while you frantically try and get that stupid swipey thing to like accept your credit card and 800 cars are lining up behind you and honking like New Yorkers do, it is New Yorkers who sort of figured out that, hey, paying is a really big inhibiting pressure, right? And wouldn't it be great if I didn't block the street while I did this? So, uh, and vice versa, how do we actually beat smoking in America? Well, we did make laws and taxes and all those other kinds of things, but that's not how we won. We won because we banned advertising. When I was a kid and you drove down the highway, there was the Marlboro Man and Virginia Slims and Joe Camel, and that was every billboard, every TV commercial, every you know magazine was full of cigarette ads, and then we banned them. We attacked the promoting pressure, the reasons people did it in the first place. You can't make it look cool, right? So when we got rid of those promoting pressures, you dramatically reduced the, uh, the degree to which people smoke. And if you look at where people smoke in the US now, it is almost always in places where there is social facilitation, where other people are doing it around them and it looks and feels cool, then they do it, right? Because of the promoting pressure of, of fitting in and that social piece, right? So what we're doing in the scientific method, what we have to do as product people is systematically eliminate our biases through frameworks and processes that cause us to do that, right? Now, they're only as good as the people who operate them. We have to stick to them, but they do help us in that way. All right. Uh, what are the pros or cons of being very specific abroad and how we define success? Uh, I can think of no pros in terms of broad, right? Specific wins the day every time. Because here's the thing, you can always build on specificity. The only downside to specificity is this, right? If you set the bar too low, right? If you set the bar too low. So what I always say about behavioral statements, remember I said it's a negotiation between you and your stakeholders, right? If you're the head of products, it's often between you and the CEO or, or you know, sort of the business part of the business side of, of the world. 
you need to take on the most ambitious behavioral statement that you can actually accomplish, right? So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, you know, you, if, if you don't own how something shows up in the Apple store, then you probably don't want to take on the behavior that is downloads, right? Because you don't own the surface area. You can't pull the levers that change that behavior. But generally speaking, you want to take on the most ambitious thing. So I don't think it's about broad versus specific. I think it's about am, like ambition of how big or hard that behavior is, right? And the size of that population, right? Rather than a very small, you know, target audience. Remember, I decompose things that Scott's working over here on just, you know, young women in LA, right? He's working on a very small subgroup. You want to take on the most ambitious thing that you can affect with the levers that are available to you. Part of that depends on how you choose to parse up the levers in your company. The, the, the difference between product and marketing has become increasingly muddled over the last 20 years or so, in part because we can't really agree on who gets to touch what, right? It might be better to say, hey, what we're really trying to do is drive different behaviors, but it's going to be arranged differently in every company, David. And so I think you have to look for like, well, what, what are you allowed to touch and then take on the most ambitious thing? Jack, do you have some favorite metrics or scoring models directly related to behavioral analysis? Um, you know, I, I favor, so, you know, as a, I used to run Microsoft Ventures in New York and sort of as a, as a activist investor and things, I, you know, resilient businesses affect larger numbers of people generally. So that means usually I prefer data things that are more like percentage of people who have ridden at least twice this week over total number of rides. Why? Because the total number of rides, I can just get Yuki the super user, right? I build something for someone who's going to do it 150,000 times a million times a week, right? And that is a great business, but a fragile business, right? Because if Yuki switches to another service, someone else out competes me, right? Now my whole business falls over like a house of cards. But if I got everybody in this chat, Kate and, and Kramali and Mike and Mohit and Nick and Nikita and Ryan and Sky and Yuki are all riding at least twice a week, even if Yuki goes off to another services, I've got a lot more resilience there. So I tend to prefer percentage of population-based metrics, but it's different for different people. And I can understand why people build highly depth products for very specific audiences where they want a lot of behavior. So I think it depends a, a, a little bit. Um, got it. Yeah. Um, there are all of, you know, I... Hers and rice and you know their lovely trust metrics and equations and things. The worry that I have with those scores sometimes, right, is that they make us, they force us to make trade-offs, right? And one of the golden rules of behavioral statements is that they're like Highlander. There can be only one. I can only be going after one behavior, right? So if if I go after the behavior that is download and use. There's actually a subordinate relationship there. How do I know? Well, if I went to Nikita, our new CEO, and I said, I can just phrase it as two opposing parts of a thing. I can get everybody in the world to download it, but no one uses it. Versus I can get everyone in the world to use it, but no one downloads it. Which one of those would you prefer? Well, obviously usage trumps downloads, right? So instead of them being parallel like this, they're actually like this. I care about downloads only to the degree that it causes usage, right? And so if I hold the pen up here, right? If I'm at the right side, then I can pivot down here. Maybe I don't need people to download it. Maybe I just get it self-installed on their phone. So all phones come with the thing. Maybe they don't even need the app, right? I read their brainwaves or they're circulating like taxis. I don't know, right? But my solution set opens up when I hold it from the right side. I'll give you a, a, a great example, Jack. Um, uh, I think it should be hers because there's way too many uh, white dudes in products. So I'm all for that. Uh, I'll give you an, a real life example, Jack. So so Microsoft bought Yammer. Um, for those of you that don't know and are not, uh, not old like me, Yammer was like an internal engagement product, sort of social media for, you know, like Facebook, but internal to a company for big company to help people talk to each other. Um, they bought them for some <laughs> billion dollars. And um, they were having some trouble integrating into Microsoft and, and really getting their product where they need to go. So I flew down. And I got all the product managers in the room and I listened and I said, look, you have a fundamental problem, right? You are trying to create two different behaviors and you don't agree on what it is. So half the room, let me tell you about Jerome. Jerome logs in every fucking day. Every day he logs in. He is the most engaged user you've ever seen. He comments, he posts, he likes, he does all the things he engages with everybody. He's very, very social. Well done, Jerome. Creates no business value of any kind, but he's very engaged, right? Then there's Jeanette. Jeanette logs in one time in her entire career, makes one post, but that one post drives massive business value, massive business value, right? 
And I said, who are you designing for? And half the room thought they were trying to create Jerome and half the room thought they were trying to create Jeanette, right? Half the room thought it was about creating business impact, right? Behaviors that led to direct monetization, right? And others thought that it led to, that, that it was about engagement. Now, after further discussion, we understood that other people, the people were making some different assumptions, right? So the people who thought they were designing for Jerome, they thought they were designing for engagement. They had a mental model where, well, if I get everyone engaged, surely business value will come, right? Business value will come from engagement, right? So it's not that they disagreed with the Jeanette people. It's just that they meant in their mental model, believe that engagement will lead to business value. So all we had to do was say, no, no, if you're saying it's about business value, let's be clear it's about business value and maybe engagement leads. And this is something we can test, right? We can launch pilots. We can we can have sub behavioral statements where we go after engagement. But if I prove to you that, that mere engagement doesn't lead to more business value, then presumably you would pivot away because you're saying business value is the thing that actually matters, right? So picking the right understanding of what behavior you wanna create in the world is incredibly important. That's why we write behavioral statements the way that we do, right? There's almost always some relationship belief that I have in my mind that we need to question uh, that assumption, right? We need to get all on the same page about, well, what are we really trying to do here? And then we can have different ways of doing that. That's awesome, right? We're not always going to build exactly the same features to serve exactly the same people, but we want to be pivoting around the right point, right? If that makes sense. Drew, I'm glad I got to know. Glad I called it right. Jeanette's like, I create all the business value in the world. It's amazing. Um, now, a lot of people will be like, oh, this looks similar to what I'm doing right now. The devil is in the details, right? I, this is why I said, try getting your team to all write behavioral statements. I guarantee you they will come back with different behavioral statements, right? They will not be all aligned, right? It's very easy to think, well, I'm relying on those quantitative and qualitative insights, but often we use them as like background research, right? We're like, well, this gives me a grounding in the topic, right? And then I'm going to go into a brainstorm and brainstorm feature ideas. No, like what we do is we take pressures and then we say very specifically, how am I changing that pressure? Not what are good ideas in the world? I don't care if they're like good, sexy ideas. I care that they are directly linked to the pressures that underlie them so that I then can go through that testing. I can say, hey, is what I did able to change the pressure? Did changing the pressure actually change the behavior? And then I did I do it in a way that was worth it, whatever that means, for our business? Does that make sense? This is very hard because I can't see you. I feel very alone. Product people want to live with other product people. What questions do you have that I haven't answered, right? Um, what questions, if you're nodding along and going, yes, this is great, like ask me questions about implementing it. If not, I'll rattle off some more examples, right? I've had a long career of sort of doing this. You know, one of my favorite examples, my first startup was um, in the personal finance space. We were Mint's biggest competitor. We sold to Lending Tree, And because we sold, right, got acquired, that's, you know, that's the thing everybody hopes for, right? So it was good in that sense. But we had a very basic problem, which is that we misunderstood the behaviors of our users in a very important way. One of the things that we did to change behaviors, financial-based behaviors, was we gave people a financial score, right? This is, uh, uh, you should be happy, Jack. I'm talking about scoring, right? So we gave them a score. And I didn't just want to replicate the, the, the credit score, which really just rewards rich people and penalizes people who have fewer resources, right? I wanted something that said, well, based on how much money you have, how well are you managing it? So we did things like, you know, given how much, you know, what is your how much money did you save as a percentage of your income, right? As a function of your income. And when you look at it that way, women kick the shit out of men. They are much better savers than men as a percentage of their income. The problem is when I take away as percentage of their income, men win on raw dollars. Why? Why? Well, because the gender wage gap. We underpay women by 20 to 50%, depending on your ethnicity, because it, you know, is, is, sort of crosses with ethnicity, like by 20 to 50%. And so it doesn't matter how well I get them to budget because they're being underpaid in the first place. But every financial app only starts when you have the money. It doesn't do anything about what happens prior to having the money. So we need to, we sold it, but we need to solve this problem. So we said, all right, we're going to go build a little side project. We're going to do something on the side, right? So let's walk through this. I know the behavioral statement I want, right? Um, I, I know the behavioral statement I want. I want look, I really want to change the systemic barriers in the world, but I can't do that. So I have to act on women's behavior. So when employed women want to be paid fairly, they will ask for a raise as measured by number of women who ask for and get a percentage of women who ask for and get a raise, right? All right. I know what I want. Now I have to go look into the world, right? I have to understand what is going on from a pressure. Is this an inhibiting pressure problem? Is it a promoting pressure problem? Why aren't women asking for raises and getting them in the same way? All right. Well, let's go look at this. So I wish we could, all the women could have their cameras on because we could do this research right now. We can use the chat. I'm ready. 
All right, here you go, women. I want you to put a, put a little uh, a smiley face in the chat if you do not want to be paid fairly. That is, if you want your male counterparts to make more than you for the same work, just put a little face in the smiley chat. Face in the smiley chat? Smiley face in the chat. One of the things. No? You sure? I'll give you a second. Maybe it's hard to find that button. No smiley faces? Wow. Well, maybe it's not a promoting pressure problem. Maybe the problem isn't that women don't want enough. Now, obviously, you're all like, yeah, Matt, no shit, right? It is obvious that the problem is not that women don't want enough. But this is like 2010, right? What is the leading book in the market? It's lean in, right? Every woman should want it more, right? For 50 years, we've been saying, women, you got to want to be the executive. You got to want, want, want. It's all about your passion and desire, right? No, it's not. It's not a promoting pressure problem. It's an inhibiting pressure problem. I worry if I ask, I'm going to get fired, right? I'm going to be penalized for it. I'm not going to get the raise. I don't know how to ask. I don't know if I'm underpaid. They're all inhibiting pressure-based things, right? So I got to design something against that. So I'm going to go pilot. I'm just going to go on my, remember, I'm no code, no code pilots. This is a big Matt Wallet rule, no code pilots. You got to do it low fidelity first, right? And I don't mean low fidelity by like, go make wireframes. That's all usability testing. That's build the thing right. I want to know if I'm building the right thing. So I just go on my social media and say, hey, Women, if you think you're underpaid, send me a DM and I'm going to coach you through asking for a raise. I'll help you get the data. I'll help you figure out what you're going to say. We'll write a script. We'll write a letter. I'll help you, right? So we do this five or 10 times. I just sit there and I just help women ask for and get raises. What works? What doesn't work, right? We work together to figure out, hey, what is actually getting women to ask and how does, it, how does that then uh, get their bosses to say yes? And then and only then do we start building that into a product, right? We essentially make a Mad Lib generator, right? I have a letter that is very well formatted, that lays out a reasonable raise request. Then I just start asking you questions. Where do you work? How much do you make? How long have you been there? Right? When was your last raise? What was it? What have you done to add value in the last six months? What are you going to do in the next six months? You know, I suck in data from the government that says you're underpaid. I suck in open job postings of like places you could go and make more. And then I give this all as a packet to your boss, right? It takes about 10 minutes to get through. It took us about a weekend to build. It's pretty easy, right? This ran for 10 years. We ran this as an experiment for 10 years. 80% um, of the women who handed in the letter got a raise. The average raise is about 7,500 bucks. And collectively, they earned about $4 billion in raises over the course of 10 years over something that took a weekend to build, right? But we were very aligned. We knew what behavioral statement we wanted, right? We knew exactly what I wanted people to do. Who was I talking about? What happened, right? I went out into the world. I understood it. It's not a promoting pressure problem. It's not an inhibiting pressure problem. I understood the difference between always, never, sometimes, start, stop. Who's doing it? Who's not doing it, Right? Then I built very specifically on top of those pressures, right? Launched a small pilot where I did this in person. And then, and only then did I start to lay code and build something, right? And get into the like, build it the right way and figure out a design and all that stuff. Only then when I had all those other pieces lined up and I knew that I could pull the lever and the lever would change the behavior and the behavior would re result in the thing I want. Only then did I move forward. Uh, where is it now? The code got kind of creaky and old. So we took it down. Uh, we talk about rebuilding it uh, periodically. Um, I think what is likely to happen is that uh, miscellaneous this large financial institution is going to do this part as part of doing your taxes. Because if you do your, if we do your taxes, we actually know all of this data, right? I know how much you make. I know what you do. I know where you work. And I can just say to you, hey, you are underpaid. Let me just fill this in for you. And here's a letter that you could give to your boss, by the way, along with your tax return. That's the most likely outcome right at the moment. Uh, let me scroll up and ask some questions. Uh, how do you develop a statement for a whole business with multiple product areas? Ellen, great question. So we have to acknowledge this waterfall piece. We have to be willing to put down accountabilities, right? To say, hey, well, what is this part of the business? What, biz what behavior are they monetizing is usually the first question I ask, right? Because monetization, the monetizable behavior kind of has to go at the top, right? That... It, it, that, you know, the CEO is essentially responsible for the monetizable behavior. Then we need to say, okay, well, what behaviors support that? And how are we going to decompose that, right? Downloading the app, using the app, completing the ride and paying for it, right? We can decompose that. And it's different for different businesses. But usually the thing we monetize has to go at the very top, right? So that's usually how I sort of develop develop statements. And again, they're a negotiation between me and my stakeholders. There is no right or wrong when you make a behavioral statement. It is just what your stakeholders will accept, right? Are you taking on enough? Do you own these levers? How are we defining it? What target audience are we going after? Like, we just need to be precise about those things. And, you know, we will correct them over time. If you think about OKRs, they are sort of this, right? OKRs, in theory, are supposed to do this. The problem is there's no real format for writing OKRs well. And they often like go off in weird directions and mix in tactical things. We need to be very clear about what behavior we're trying to create before we get into it. Like what tactics am I committing to? Because in reality, 
if you did the tactics, but they didn't change the behavior, I wouldn't care about them, right? Like successfully launching the feature is not a very good accountability because like then all I can hold you accountable for is process metric. This is why I said accountability and autonomy are linked, right? So imagine Scott is a quantitative researcher on one of my projects. By the way, everybody has the same team. It's a strategist, quant, qual, um, designer, and a product manager, right? Though that is the team. Each of them own one of the phases, right? The strategist says, what is the, you know, is works with the stakeholders to figure out what is the, you know, business goal that we're trying to accomplish? What's the behavior? How do we monetize it? This is incredibly important work and it needs to be done up front. I'll give you a great example. When I was the chief behavioral officer at Clover Health, CEO came to me and said, Matt, I want you to get people flu shots. It's very important that we get people flu shots. We're an insurance company, get people flu shots. So I asked the executive team, how much do you think we make as a business when we get somebody a flu shot? Now, it's interesting in Medicare Advantage because you both get paid by the government on getting people flu shots and you reduce your medical expenditure because they don't end up in the hospital. So you get like a double whammy. And so they said, eh, it's probably about 10 bucks. I sat down with an actuary. We did a bunch of statistical analysis. It's a hundred bucks, right? Every person we get a hundred bucks is a flu shot is about a hundred bucks the business, right? You have to do that strategy piece upfront to understand how important is this behavior because it's going to change how much money I can spend, how much time I can spend building things, you know, what levers I can pull, right? And if you're off by an order of magnitude, it's going to totally redefine what you build. So strategists, then I need quant researchers and qual researchers, data scientists and user researchers. They have to work together, right? It's not like they go off for six months and come back with a thing, right? No, no. They're literally talking every day, right? If Scott gives me a quantitative insight on Monday, I want Sky to be doing a qualitative interview on it on Tuesday to confirm it or disconfirm it, right? We want that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This whole process from the initial behavioral statement to a completed pilot with evidence should take more than about no more than about 12 to 14 weeks right? Because that's about as long as any leader will wait to make a strategic decision. You have to keep it tight. You can always run it more than once if you need to, right? But it has to stay small and tight and discreet, which means we need to be a lot scrappier than we are. We are often set up to do large, big, chunky things. We need to decompose them into smaller things, right? Um, so uh, then we then we have a designer, right? Who takes those, those helps lead us through. And by the way, people don't come on and off this team. It's not like a, a researcher is here and then they get assigned to another project. They follow it through the whole 12 weeks because now they have the context and we need those additional brains and those additional perspectives. So the designer helps lead us through a, okay, we, now we know the pressures. What are we going to do about them? And then the project manager really owns the pilot, right? They're skilled in experiments. How do I actually bring something to life in the world in, in order to figure out did we actually change the pressure? Did the pressure change the behavior? And was that big enough to satisfy our stakeholders in terms of, of magnitude, right? So those are the five key roles. And then usually we talk about what many of you probably are, which is a behavioral science leader, right? Which is the person who's really overseeing this whole, this whole sort of shenanigans, right? They're, they're working across multiple teams, making sure they're on track, making sure the process that they're hiring, firing, doing all the management things we need to do. All right, your advice on the easy way to convince management that we must invest more in this behavioral angle because you're <laughs> very concerned that we do need to. Um, but lovely, it's a great question, Jack. Um, I think it depends on the business and it depends on what your behavior, what your leaders tend to be, to be convinced by. I think you simultaneously need to increase promoting pressure and reduce inhibiting pressure. So one, use examples from companies that they admire about how they have successfully changed behavior and acted on that. Right. So you got to increase that promoting pressure. You can also talk to things within your own business. Hey, we tend to be doing a lot of epiphany based design. If you look at the last 10 features that we launched, only two of them were successful. And most of them were decided on because somebody decided they were a good idea, not because we had evidence that they were a good idea. Right. So you can show, hey, where are the deficiencies in our current process? The bigger lever, Jack, remember what I said. Usually when we think about getting people to do something, we over index on getting them to want to do it right? The biggest problem I actually find with behavioral science is people say, eh, it's too expensive. I don't know how to do it. Like those sorts of things. So you have to reduce the inhibiting pressure. You have to say, hey, there is a four-step process we can go to. There are frameworks that we can use like behavioral statements. There are books like Matt Wallert's or Amy Buker's that can help us do this, right? This is not outside of our range of ability. We don't have to spend a bunch more money, right? Notice I talked about a leader, a strategist, a quanta qual, a designer, and a project manager. You probably already have all those inside of your business. You might need to arrange them differently, put them into a different framework, give them some cross training, right? But at the end of the day, they all are already there. So it's not like we have to go spend a bunch of additional money. We just need to reorient what we're doing. So again, increase the promoting pressure, talk about examples of how this brings benefit, but then reduce the inhibiting pressure. Say, here, you know what? We can do this. This is not impossible. It's not that hard. And if you need my help, I will do it, right? I run a company um, called bsci.io, behavioral science and organizations. And we only do this. We just 
All we do all day, every day is help embed this function in companies. It's a collection of all of sort of the most famous applied behavioral scientists. So the head of behavioral science at Morningstar and US Bank and all of these other places, they've been doing this for a really long time. All of us sort of consult on the side, right, to help grow this in the world. And so, you know, we give talks, like we can absolutely help you do this thing, but it's about showing them it's not that hard to do because I think that's what's holding people back most of the time. There is a great white paper or three out there, a book you've written. I wrote a book called uh, Start at the End. Uh, there's a book by Amy Buker I really like. The name escapes me right at the moment. Something like Designing for Behavior Change. I think that's a great book. Um, you know, I, I, I would steer you away from sort of the nudge, you know, sort of Chip Heath kind of like popular psych version of the world. I think those are very entertaining, but they don't, but they don't reduce the inhibiting pressure. They just give you phenomenological promoting pressure. They're like, hey, this is really cool. They don't really tell you how to do it. So you want to look for books by people who actually do this in the world. There's lots of talks by great people. If you go to um, bsci.io and you look at the list of consultants that we all work at, the collectivist, right? We all have sort of full-time jobs doing something else at other companies as behavioral scientists. That's a good list. Any talk by any of those people will give you really practical things. You can often find one of those people, you know, they're across a huge spread of industries. So usually you can send a note to one of those people who's in your industry and say, hey, would you mind talking to me about this? Um, we're, we're a chatty group. We like behavioral science, right? We've dedicated our lives to this and we believe it is the future. And so they're usually willing to tell you, you know, how they do it at their company. And you can always come find me. I'm very easy to find. So I'm just Matt at mattwallard.com. I can spell my name maybe. Uh, I'm at Matt Wallard on Twitter. Like there is a lovely, I have open office hours that you can sign up for where we actually talk about this one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I know that I got a lovely note from someone who signed up for this. Scott, this is a good success for you. For you. They signed up for this based on the title. And then they realized that actually I'm an advisor to their startup. And they were like, oh my God, you're in my Slack channel. What is happening right now? So uh, clearly, uh, Scott, you are having good penetration uh, into the product community. Uh, so that was, a, that was a nice victory. I know you want a few minutes to do some wrap up tasks. Any last questions I can answer? I know I've given you lots of ways to come find me later and ask me things if you wanted to. Any last questions you want to get answered in this session today? Yes, give feedback. Feedback is important. Helps me be a better speaker if you think I could do something differently. Uh, I appreciate the person who said, please slow down. I do talk kind of fast. We have a video so that you can rewatch this. Uh, I'm just trying to fit it in the time. 0.5 speed. Yeah, exactly. Just, you know, that's what that's what 0.8 is for. <laughs> so that everyone can understand what Matt Wallard is saying. So he sounds less like a chipmunk. <laughs> awesome. I don't think there's any more questions, but we'll leave that open uh, for other people definitely on that side. Again, everybody really appreciate you attending today. And if you do have a moment, uh, please do share your feedback. We'd love to get that. Um, just a few things to wrap up here today before we let Matt go uh, on this really exciting session. Uh, feel free to continue that discussion in the community. Uh, open a post, start a new conversation. Uh, again, we'd be happy to, to get Matt involved in that and, and have him share his ideas or thoughts uh, where needed. We've got a lot of different upcoming events uh, in the next few weeks here. Uh, our Embracing Uncertainty Product Excellence Summit is next week. Uh, feel free to join us there if you're interested. Um, we've also got events every single week coming up uh, now through mid-December. Um, and quite a few posted on this. Our Vendetta next week, Benjamin Berry, uh, Prana Call, David Reimer, Josh Snyden, Nils Davis, and Connie Kwan, JJ Rory. Just some of them actually taking us into mid to late November alone. Um, so really, you know, do check out some of the event calendar, good opportunities here to learn, uh, engage on this side and, and, and get new, new, new insights into how to do your product practices better. And again, lots of other ways to get involved in the community, whether you wanna meet other people through our Maker Mentor Program, uh, our next cohort starts in October, uh, our round tables, which happen monthly, our Meter Maker Program, where you can connect with other people, 30 minute conversations one-on-one, -on -one. or if you wanna bring your own experiences and knowledge into this, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, as a potential speaker uh, here within our uh, product makers community. So with that, um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And uh, Matt, once again, really, really appreciate the, uh, the deep insights and all the excitement today. It was really, really fantastic. Scott, thanks for having me. I'm doing a lightning round of, of you know, basically you flash through all these wonderful speakers who are coming up. So I'm trying to rewrite <laughs> their product lines. Um, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoy your Thursday. Do good things with this, you know, we didn't talk about ethics. There's a whole chapter in the book on ethics. It's an important topic. But, you know, 
at the end of the day, behavioral science is, and it's like science is an agnostic tool, it can be used for terrible, evil things. And if you do terrible, evil things with it, uh, you have to fight me. And I'm like the mega boss, so you don't want to do that. Um, yeah. right? Try and find good things in the world to do with this. You can make tons of money. You can be very profitable right, by serving people's actual needs rather than creating needs that they don't have or preying on their insecurities. right? Use behavioral science responsibly. Please, 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 please don't be a Facebook. And um, if, you, if, you, if you're not sure that you're doing that, come find me and I'll help you. All right. Awesome. See you all. Really appreciate it.